Hello and welcome to the Girlfriend God Podcast, a podcast in search of and in service to the Divine Feminine, bringing you an equal mix of academic research and emotional spiritual experience. If you enjoy the Girlfriend God, please share it, rate it, or leave a review. Let's Let's get get in the flow. Hello. Today, Good morning. I'm happy to have Janelle Rhiannon in the hot seat. She's oh. the creator and host of the Greek Mythology Retold podcast and also the author of the Homeric Chronicles, a retelling of the Trojan War era, which you can purchase at Amazon. Amazon. I know I work or wherever you buy your books. Uh, the yeah, first I... three books are out, and she's currently working on the fourth. Janelle has a master's degree in history. And in her research, she focused on, I thought this was very interesting. She focused on Alexander the Great and his use of clothing as a political means to control his overreaching empire. She believes that history really is storytelling, and that's what fuels her curiosity about the past for her writing and research. You can find Janelle online at JanelleRiannon.com or at Janelle Rhiannon and Greek Mythology Retold on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube and Facebook. And today we're going to be talking about relationships and marriages and the women left behind during the Trojan War. Yeah. So, now, <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So I'm glad I found you on Instagram yourself. Got into, you know, listening to what you were saying about all the goddesses and uh, women that really resonated. So I appreciate being on your show. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So you had sent me a list, uh, which I promptly didn't have up on the screen. So <laughs> let's go to your list and tell me about uh, the things that you came prepared to talk about today. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think on my list were Penelope, Clytemnestra, and Anoni. So yes. everybody... When we when people think about the Trojan War, I don't know. Uh, one of the things that makes my series unique is that I have put the events in a chronological order, mm-hmm. and it took me about a year to do that because when the bards were singing about the Trojan War, they, and they were they the stories were coming from all various regions. It wasn't like a, the story was a central point and and moved out. So the right. the stories about the heroes primarily were told here and there, and some stories would come together. So there was never any sense of chronology, right, about when these characters were doing what, you know. But you do have you do have elements of somebody being a son or daughter of somebody. So one of the things that I did was try to think about, okay, like if an average span would be about, I just kind of looked at about 18 to 20 years of like have a baby, next generation, next generation, and then tried to put everything in sort of this chronology. And, right. and um, that, and I forget where I was going with that was because it had well, something to do I mean, with the it's women. It's interesting that, that you say that because so much of mythology is like that, right? Like yeah. you have the scattered pieces from different civilizations in different time periods and I think it's really only through archaeology and anthropology that we can really definitively put things in any kind of a a timeline right right and I and I get but I get what you're saying that in these songs of the bards there are clues yes there are clues as to when that was and right how that interpretation came about Right. And we, ha- we have, we, we pretty much, I mean, archaeology is now, you know, pretty certain they know where the ancient city of Troy was. And I think it's level Troy six or Troy seven. And um, the idea that the Trojan War was just a myth is no longer a, a myth. Like there is right. pretty was, much like that. That was a war. It happened yeah. in my one of my favorite books is this one by uh, Barry Strauss. And he talks about how in the, in the oral tradition, you know, the one thing that would have stuck 
you know, even if the stories are a little bit different and thinking about when stories, this is before stories are written down, right? So the one thing that would remain the same, the easiest thing for bards to remember would be names. So these were probably actual people or amalgamations of or embellishments on, say, actual individuals who fought in the war. And I guess where I was going with the chronology was that most people think of the movie Troy. They land on the beach, you know, maybe a month later, there's this great siege of the city. It didn't really happen like that. It was, right. It was it, um, it took place almost, over several years, right? Yeah, it was almost a decade. So the Iliad opens up like in the ninth year and it's catalogs the last 40 or so days before uh before Troy's going to fall, like like that time period, and um, in that in that ten year gap, it, for me, when I'm putting the time, like, well, what's happening? You know, what's going on? And right. so that sort of lays that that allows to lay down a foundation of what's what's going on with the families, the women, and who's, um, uh, you, you know. Ha- how are all of these? How are all of these families that we know that have their own stories that eventually bleed into the Trojan War? So, I do use the archaeological date as sort of a pinpoint, and I built the timeline before and after. And so, I use a lot of sources for that. Why the I, Trojan I, War? Why, of all the things in mythology, <laughs> why the Trojan War? Um, I've. It's a little kind of a long story. Here we go. So when I was in graduate school, I was fascinated with, I became fascinated with Alexander the Great. I started studying ancient Rome under Dr. Diane Harris, who uh, was a, a mentor of mine. And she now teaches, I believe, in uh, in Chicago somewhere. She and her husband are both archaeologists. And uh, she was just very fascinating so she kind of turned me on to the ancient world in graduates in my undergrad and then that's what I pursued in my master's and then I started studying um Alexander the Great was what I chose and then I also interested in textiles and clothing and so I started taking some classes in historical costuming and then that's kind of what branched into I started merging these ideas and when I was time to talk about my thesis as I studied Alexander I started noticing you know that how his use of clothing became like this contention between him and he between him and and the Macedonians Mm -hmm. and so I don't know I just I just took off from there and then one of the stories was that Alexander would sleep with the and this was under Plutarch I think it, that Alexander would sleep with a copy of the Iliad underneath his pillow and that he was sort of supposed to be emulating Achilles. I hadn't read the Iliad until then. And right. that was 20 some years ago. And so I was like, what is this? What is this Iliad? You know, I knew Achilles, right? But right, I didn't, right. I, I hadn't, I only knew what everybody else knew, like that you saw in a movie or you just sort of heard, you know, the, his Achilles heel, he got shot in the, you know, heel with the arrow or whatever. And um, so that led me to read the Iliad. And by that time I ended up with Dr. Harris had to, she went back East um, to teach. And so my next mentor who had to take over the middle of my thesis project was Dr. Davis, uh, Victor Davis Hanson. And he knew, he was very deep into the Iliad and the Odyssey. And he said, you know, as you get older, I, he said, basically you're an Iliad person or an Odyssey person. Uh-huh. And, <laughs> and. Uh, like you can't be a Giants fan and a Jets fan. <laughs> you're right. Like that. Yeah. And so now I, and at first I was very much an Odyssey person because that was, I felt like that was an easier story to digest. It seemed more fantastical. Right. And then I became more enamored with and curious about the Iliad. And and I I mean, I've gone back and forth now for my whole life and I've read several translations. And my favorites that I have used so far are um, 
This one I have, I used the Iliad uh, by Caroline Alexander. I love her translation. That's my favorite. I've read all the other ones. They're all men. And then this one is, <laughs> right? And then I've got the Emily uh, Wilson's uh, The Odyssey, which I love her translation of that too. And I've also read different translations, but um, those two women's, I, 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 I use those as a background. I try to always use women translators just because I think as it gives us a different perspective and that right. sometimes we choose, you know, when you get, when you have a choice between how you can translate something from Greek and I'm, and I don't, I don't have Greek or Latin, just very rudimentary things that I would have to verify with my, with my mentors. But I find that very intriguing, you know? So, um, well, even like the bards, right? Whoever is telling the story, no matter how impartial they attempt to be, they're still human. Right. And they still have their own right. personal beliefs and, right? Right. I, f I find that the older I've got, that the more I see the Iliad and the Odyssey as really just telling the story about being human. And that I think that's what has continued to hold my fascination that's why i want to tell these stories um i do tell them in a really, really adult spicy way some people don't <laughs> appreciate that but you know those people have no sense of humor then they right? have they have no no sense of humor and there are writers that you, i it's really difficult because I, i've had some people read them expecting a very feminist slant or view. Um, I don't write them. I don't write them that way. And, and I've been, I, I try, you know, as a writer, you try not to read all your reviews, but some people right. really criticize that. And I, I'm like, you know, I'm a woman and I, you know, you can't tell me how to be a woman. <laughs> right. Right. You or can't, like, the, yeah, you can't, you, you know, and so I, I, I try to keep the spirit of the myths the way they are. I'm not really trying to rewrite, uh, rewrite it. I, and, and I guess this right. goes back I mean, to the, the timeline, like, is, isn't yeah. Greek history rewritten? It's, <laughs> right. right. It's Greek history right. retold. Right. Um, so which I, is all that which is like I mean that's what historical fiction as a genre is. Right. right? We yeah, we can't you can't you, I mean if my podcasts are much more academically inclined, so mm -hmm. I will include my sources and, and that's where I get my I draw my inspiration from. But when I'm telling the story, I might I'm not really trying to create a uh, a I'm not I'm not trying to school you on ancient greek culture that's right. not the goal right. i'm just telling i'm telling the human story right? right and that that kind of goes back to the timeline as i roll around with these all these ideas like well what would motivate somebody for a period of time you know mm -hmm. why would they do that how would they feel about that and 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 in graduate school they call that you can't psychoanalyze you know historical figures but now i think we've moved away i mean that was over 20 years ago so we've moved away from from the the idea that you can't because as a human being certain things are going to affect you so like my, my uh the achilles that i write is kind of a jerk mm -hmm. not because not because he's a man, but because he has PTSD. Mm. Like, how could he or any of those guys not be suffering from PTSD after yeah, 10 right. years of killing, <laughs> raping, war, pillaging, war <laughs> right. living out of tents, living off their boats? Like, how, how could they not be traumatized in their psyche right. in, in some way? How would that manifest? So the Achilles I wrote starts drinking more and more till he's kind of a drunkard mm -hmm, mm -hmm. violent and when the opening line is you know of achilles in the iliad is like sing sing of the rage of achilles well that rage is part of you know 
he's losing his humanity. Right. And he loses it at the end. You know, that's we're watching him unravel as a human being. So I, I take that same lens and that's what I'm looking at the women with too. And so we, we see, um, Perseus is mentioned in the Iliad, Andromaca, Hecuba, uh, ver- that's it. And then we have the Circe, Calypso, and Penelope, primarily in the Odyssey. Of course, right. Athena, Aphrodite, back and forth in, the, in both. But the the uh, in in the Iliad, the story of like what Penelope, Clytemnestra, and Anoni are going through. Anoni happens. A lot of people don't know who Anoni is, but I'll get I'll get to that one. But those are the three women I I thought would be interesting to talk about. Penelope's story starts before the Iliad, uh, because her husband, right, Odysseus, has to go to war. He gets called, and Clytemnestra, her daughter Iphigenia, is sacrificed and. So her husband can go off to war. And then Anoni is the wife of Paris, who it's his first wife. And he's she's a wood nymph. And she is a aban- He abandons her when he takes Helen and moves to the city of Troy. So I have like the two women who are left behind. Penelope is considered the virtuous woman. Um, and Clytemnestra is the not virtuous woman both of them are <laughs> both of them are they're both, basically they're left behind as queens right they have royal status they have power in a world where most women didn't have power and then there's a noni who is a nymph right so she's a immortal but she has a great emotional suffering and she's like the forgotten wife so she doesn't have <clears throat> She's outside of that sort of any kind of construct that the ancient world may have had for women, except right. the fact that she gets left behind by a husband who chooses to go to Troy and event you know goes to war. So um, that was those. That's what I wanted to talk about. So, um, let's see, who should we talk about first? Uh, yeah. Okay, let's do uh, Penelope. Are you familiar with the story of uh, how Odysseus? A little, but okay. let's not assume that anyone listening. Okay, all right. Is, so Pen- Pen- Penelope is actually a cousin of Helen and Clytemnestra. So her father and their father were brothers. That's how they're connected. Pen- Odysseus wins Penelope's hand in a foot race after um, Odysseus helps King Tyndareus come up with the the plan to make sure that Helen gets married off without his having to throw his kingdom into turmoil and war because uh, all the suitors have descended upon Sparta to marry Helen. So there's that story, and so that's when that's when Odysseus meets Penelope at that gathering of suitors and then penelope and odysseus get married and go back to ithaca they are there for not too long um they have telemachus and soon after that is when this when helen she married she does marry um menelaus and a little bit of time about it i would give it about a year or two as i put it in a timeline a little bit of time has to pass because babies had to get conceived and then born. Helen is leaves an infant to go off with Paris to Troy. There's a whole bunch of reasons why she would do that. I don't think she was kidnapped. I think she made a choice. And, and she was also under, I believe, the way I wrote it, a love spell by Aphrodite. Because Aphrodite was fulfilling a promise that she made to Paris because she she won the contest of who was the fairest. So there's a lot of things going into there. There are a lot of things in the background, I believe, that go in that go feed into that story. But that's a whole other subject. <laughs> so Penelope uh, Odysseus doesn't want to leave his young wife, his new new son, 
he gets tricked into going because he took the oath, which was that he promised if anything happened to Helen, that he would fight to win her, to help her husband get, get her back. So he has to go. Uh, He gets tricked into going. He's pissed off, doesn't want to go, but he leaves Penelope behind with the young son. Now, what people know about Penelope is that she's like the long suffering wife that she basically waits 20 years for her husband to come back. So he's off to war doing what men do when they're at war. And that made me think a lot about um, as I'm a mom and a grandmother. So I think, what would that be like? Oh, when I grew up, my dad was in the military. So he was on nuclear submarines during the Vietnam war. So there was a lot of, I, I understood that the idea of waiting, waiting for my dad to come home all the time as a little kid. So you spend a lot of your time, not with your father, but then when, when they would come back, there'd be the, the big party, right? And everybody would be very excited about the men returning. So I, I remember that feeling of as a kid, seeing all the sailors come off of the submarine and, you know, the anticipation and the joy and the tears, right. there's something about that homecoming that unless you have been in the military, you wouldn't, I don't know if you would understand that because they would go away for on this back in that time, they didn't even have, there was no communication. Sure. Right. Right. Zero. Like uh, it had to be a super big emergency that they could, I, I want to say a telegram. I'm not even sure how they would communicate like send, with that. Send word back the home. Government. Yeah, exactly. So you, they would just be gone for nine months on a, you know, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't know anything. So um, I think what would Penelope be doing with this baby? And then she had also Odysseus's mother lived there. I always found that interesting that Odysseus's mother, Anticlea was, she remained in the the great hall, the palace with Penelope, her daughter-in-law, but the her husband, Laertes, who the former king of Ithaca, he was off on his own little plot of land doing agricultural stuff, like being basically a, a farmer. So I I often wonder like, why was that why were they split up? What 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 was that about? What happened there? <laughs> yeah, what happened there? And then I did some more research and then um I found that there was a little story somewhere and I can't I don't know who the source was, but that Odysseus had or excuse me, uh Laertes had brought a maid into the house, a woman into the household as sort of a second wife. This this was the she became the nursemaid to Odysseus, but that um, he never slept with her, which I thought, what? And that made me do a double take. Like, you, you, you brought another woman into the household as a second wife, and it was okay because you weren't going to have sex with her. And I was thinking, if I was the if I was the first wife, I don't know how I'd feel. But I, that might piss me off a little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Look, I don't know. So I try to think about like. Like would would that have anything to do with why in their older age they kind of split up? Because they're not, you know, the mom stays behind to help Penelope. She's already there. The dad's already gone by the time we hear anything about the story. Right. Obviously, obviously the dad's gone because Odysseus is already the king, but his dad's alive. So his dad just sort of stepped down and moved off to his own little farm, right? Uh, so what would Penelope be doing? She's just wasting away for 20 years, you know, raising a son as a single mom, running the kingdom. Uh, she's in charge of a lot of stuff. She has a lot of power. Right. She has a lot of power. And I often think about would like, does she wait? Would she not have waited? So I, I gave her some, I, I've, <laughs> I, I, I kind of inserted some things that I think she would not have waited. I I feel like as a woman, you know, after a period of time, you maybe you get tired of, of waiting. And then I think was, you know, just as a human being, don't you have urges? I mean, Mm -hmm. 
But that's where I put, that's where I inserted some of my spicy stuff. Maybe people don't appreciate mm -hmm. that. But I think that she's also, she's often seen as the virtuous one because she is seen to have waited and she is, is written as a woman who's kind of weepy. Um, and you have to read between the lines to see any sort of strength that she would have, you know, well, and and I think these women in mythology, right, like something we talk about on the show all the time is, is how the patriarchy sort of rewrote the story of a lot of these goddesses because they didn't want representations of strong, independent, sexual women. Women, right. Yeah, um, which is exactly what Clytemnestra is. Those early Greek sculpture sculptures of these goddesses are not older women as some of them were. They're all young, virginal, perfect, unspoiled, right? Yes. No power. No right. power. Because they're all right. like maiden age, right? Right. So I think that, you know, because like the music industry today is still very much dominated by men. I assume right. that in the land of bards, because there were no bardesses that I'm aware of, right? So right. All, all of that uh, goes into these stories that we know. So it's not surprising to me right. that Penelope was painted as this, you know, virgil, uh, virginal, you know, longing, devastated wife. Right. But you're right. And, and, I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. And so, and then I would think about, um, and I just did the, I just made a post about an olive tree because um, one of the things that the story of Odysseus and Penelope, they are uh, like, that is a heterosexual couple that have made that the mythology has sort of kept that kept together at least for a long period of time. And she really was sort of a representation for Odysseus because he kept, even when he was uh, on Calypso's Island, it was, the, the story was that he would go out and on the beach every day, kind of looking at the horizon and he would cry. And in the end, Calypso, even though he was being sexually satisfied and treated like a god and when he when it came right down to it, when he was presented with immortality, she's like, "Stay with me and be my husband, and and you know, I'll make you immortal." And then the end, he just, he didn't want it. He he rejected her, and he said, "Though you know, you're beautiful and all these wonderful things, but he really wanted to get back to his home, his wife." And there's that longing for, I think, you know, in a PTSD kind of way, right? That you want to go back to, you want the comfort of the things that you once had and right. hoping that you would find that comfort or maybe find that part of yourself that you lost during war. So Penelope was the, or at least the idea of her was a beacon for him to, to get home to. So again, she is seen as virtuous because she is right. A beacon to get home. Right. To. right. And, and the, and Agamemnon says the opposite stuff. Like, you know, when he has to give up Perseus, he's like, well, I like her better than my old bitch at home, referring to Clytemnestra. Never right. mind the fact that you freaking murdered their daughter, you know, to <laughs> get the winds to sail to all this. Like, you're the asshole. Right, <laughs> it's right. Not, it's not her, but she's she's painted already as, you know, this bitch and that he does not want to go home to. Which in stark contrast to Odysseus always refers to Penelope in a in a favorable light. So right. you you see that that contrast is already there in all of the stories. And um, so from whatever bards were feeding into it, that's you know the stories about Penelope were virtuous ones, and the stories about Clytemnestra were you know sketchy. And that was right, right. And that, you know, that all came together in that way. So I think that for Penelope. What, what were you, you going to say about the olive tree? You started to say something about the olive oh, tree. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That the olive tree, that an olive tree if, is really hard to destroy. 
And the symbol for Odysseus and Penelope was the marriage bed that he had carved one of the posts out of a living tree. So it wasn't the fact, and I didn't come to this until I actually owned olive trees. And the more you hack away at an olive tree, the more it wants to grow. And it keeps sprouting. You're like, God, I just pruned you, you know? And so like little shoots will come off everywhere. And so to carve a bedpost out of a living tree, it must have been constantly sprouting. It must have constantly needed tending. So I see a lot of symbolism there that a marriage bed or a marriage or a relationship, the sacredness of whatever this bond was, would need constant tending. And in his absence, Penelope would have to be tending that bedpost that would must have kept sprouting, right? She would have to be tending that by I, herself. I wanted to bring you back to that because so my friend and occasional co-host, Dr. Carla Ionescu, who's in Greece right now, she made this post yesterday on Instagram because she set out on a mission to find this olive tree that's 2800 years old yes and yeah it was pretty amazing so when you said olive tree i was like well that's ironic um, yeah yeah and i just made a post about an olive tree um and i wanted to do talk i was gonna i don't know i think a podcast was like brewing in my head but but about that so it says a lot about you know odysseus and penelope and that's why at the end of the odyssey when she says uh, when she's not quite sure, she's testing Odysseus to make sure that really is him because it's been a long time. And of course, Athena made him look amazingly, you know, bigger, stronger. I'm just imagining ripped and oiled, you know, like just <laughs> shiny, right. and all the all the things. And, and she's like, well, and he's like, God, you're a hard woman. Your heart is iron. Like, it's me. And she's like, well, I don't know. And he's like, fine. And, and she basically says, I'll have the maid move the bed out into the hallway. And then he gets mad that, and that's when he loses his shit at, because it's like, have you cut the tree? Cause if you cut the post right from the, from the, where it's rooted in the ground, then it's, then it's going to die. That it's no longer a living olive tree post, right. That would be tended. So that would mean that would represent a cutting of that sacred bond in a lot of ways, not just that, that she did it, but that the tree would be dead. There'd be no more leaves on it. Uh, you know, you could, it would just be a piece of wood at that point. And then, you know, obviously she's like, no, I'm just kidding. You know, and only he's supposed to know about it because he built the bed. Right. So um, what, what could so what in other words what, how was penelope then tending this tree to maintain the sacredness of her marriage and i think that the one way she would have done that would be not to have slept with men but with other women so there are a lot of maids and females in the household right and so that's how i wrote it i think that when you would have any sort of need for comfort physical sexual comfort that mm -hmm. it would be easier to have a relationship or have intimacies with other women because i don't think that that in her like i'm thinking in penelope's mind you know she has to be tending this tree it's almost like as odysseus could be watching her right uh, certainly she knew the gods were watching her uh, athena would often cause her to go into a deep sleep and they called it uh, the, her bed of sorrows hmm. so she would cry you know and missing Odysseus and so she would just get into like a magical sleep which I would equate to depression maybe right you know you get you get depressed and overwhelmed and what do you do? take a nap right yeah. so um, I, I kind of connected all those things I had I think that that would have been a way that she could still be virtuous, at least in her mind, even. And that if Odysseus knew that she had lain with other women, or if he were somehow to discover that, that that would not be offensive. 
or as a I don't know, as a lesbian, I'm pretty sure that if she was sleeping with a bunch of women, eventually she would have fallen in love with one of them. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that that was I, I was kind of going in that direction. And yeah, so yeah. as I get into book four, yeah, uh, I'm roll I'm rolling in that direction because remember at the at the Odyssey that not only there's the one uh the one maid that betrays her to um and that she has the ruse of weaving for three years re weaving the shroud for layer teas and then she goes and she weaves during the day and at night she goes and undoes it and the one one maid catches her doing it and then tells the suitors and that sort of is when the all the shit hits the fan and um Odysseus does slaughter all the maids when he mm. comes back not only does he kill all the suitors but he also uh kills all the maids he, he, see, he sees them as betraying his wife but mm -hmm. if he has an inkling that maybe some of them have been sleeping with her also he <laughs> might be more motivated <laughs> he might and, be more more motivated to slaughter them so, yeah um, so who's next on your uh, Clytemnestra. Clytemnestra is the non-virtuous right so okay. she's she's the woman who is seen she has she basically has well um, if i backtrack so Clytemnestra's story begins before agamemnon she was actually married prior i found so I, you dig into like the other sources and and um and i do i dig i dig all over the place so she had a another husband and a child prior to agamemnon and agamemnon raided the city um where she was from and uh, killed her husband, who was the prince of the city, and her child. Um, and I believe his name was Tantalus. And there were several. There were several Tant. There's Tantalus one, Tantalus two, Tantalus three. And it kind of reminded me of your podcast where you're talking about all the different Marys. Right. So names are the same, but they, you know, it's like there's different stories. There's different. There's different men that right. are being represented. So Agamemnon basically kills her first husband, kills her child, not unlike a lion would kill all of the, that takes over a pride, you know, as the main lion kills all the cubs because right. they don't want any, they don't want any of his, not his kids running around. So right. she's, she's forced to marry Agamemnon under those circumstances, if you can imagine, have to marry the man who kills your husband and your child. Like, ugh. So she's already, she, in my mind, like what would go through your mind as of what, like that you would have to do that. And I'm sure that there have been women throughout history who have had to marry men who were just, who were abusive, who had raped them prior. I mean, right. to just like, what, what, how would you, how would you as a woman have to compartmentalize yourself? Right the mental capacity of that and, and that's your own PTSD. that's your own ptsd that's your own trauma that you've got to manage and like what would that look like and so i had her mother give her advice her mother is leda who'd been raped by zeus not once but twice right um she says to her you know what you can control is is it in your world within the family? So that's what you focus on. And he can, he, he might win this battle, but don't let him win the war. Like right. women have to fight the war in a different way. And basically it was like, use your sexuality, you know, lure him, like drag him around by his cock, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so she, that you know, Clytemnestra realizes that, and and her, her mother tells her that the only power you have is in giving to children. Like, and then once you have children, then that's that's where your power lies. There, there you can you can start to exert your influence through that. So that's what Clytemnestra does, and that's all the children that we know. And so when Iphigenia um, is killed, that's then the second time that she's endured Agamemnon killing one of her children. But this time, a, a grown daughter who that she's had years of knowing, right? And um, 
not that killing her infant was better, but I mean, you, now you have a whole lifetime of memories and all the everything. And I think that the, I, I think as a mom and as a woman, like inside of your brain, you would just be like, that's fucking it. Like, like, <laughs> <boom>. like <laughs> all you could see would be red at that point. Like, I, right, I just want right. to kill this motherfucker. Like, that's all I want to do now. Right. And she's got, she's got like nine years to stew on that. Right. In the meantime, he's had to leave her as the queen. Right. She's still the queen of Mycenae while he's off doing war. Right. So she's running a kingdom. She's, uh, uh, you know, getting, you know, power in her own being and stewing about this. And in the, and t- she took up a lover, Agathus, who was Agamemnon's half brother. That's a whole other. That's a whole <laughs> other story. But uh, she's um, she's seen as not virtuous, and it's funny because Agamemnon, when he had to return Chryseis, which is the whole thing about between him and Achilles. Well, if I have to give her up, you know, like F you, I'm going to take, I'm going to take your woman, Achilles and Achilles like you, you, you son of a bitch. I'm not going to fight for you anymore. You know? <laughs> so the guys are all fighting about women and he was just like, well, I like her better than my, my cold hearted bitch back home. Clad, you know, Clad Nestra, none of you guys <laughs> like her, but it's kind of like, yeah, she probably, she hates your guts too. Like you, like how, and, and I think he has to, it's funny to me that, that that's how he thinks of her. Like you killed their daughter. Like that was right, your right. that was your daughter too. Like that was your legitimate child that you were willing to sacrifice to get the right wins. Yeah, but get- all this myth all this mythology created by men and for men is never gonna right? hold them accountable for their own behavior. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's right. the setup from the beginning. Exactly. You see that happen exactly. again and again and again. Yeah. In mythology. That's why when people are like, "Well, the patriarchy started with the Christian Church," I'm like, "No, it did not. No, it, it did was not. already happening centuries before that." So right. It's been it, and I think I. Oh gosh, I just I watched something. I'm going to go off track a little bit. I should take keep, keep notes. This is. This is how my brain literally works. Um, I, I just understand. Going Believe off. me, I understand. <laughs> I I read. I was listening to something that was talking about how that as we move towards in the modern world, this idea of equality, that for women it it just gets like worse because up until adolescence, boys and girls are girls are almost a little bit bigger until guys start to get boys start to get more testosterone. And then, but by the time you, your full grown woman or full and full grown men and women, a full grown man is body strength. Like physically they can dominate women. And that at a, and at the same time, that's also when women are having children and would theoretically like need more protection. So it's like, as a woman, you actually get less of a voice because if you're busy trying to be the mom and you're the one, like you're breastfeeding babies, like you're, and, and there was making that correlation. And for some reason that just stuck with me about how it, there is an, there is that, there is that, that thread of truth through that. And I think that, and that would be true through all of society. So we're striving for, like political in the modern world, right? Political equality, equality of pay, but physiologically and through history, and even today, women are, we are not as physically strong as men. And when men can wield their physical strength against women, that's what really makes us vulnerable. And if you were living in a time of war um, and more and living in a time where even if like 150 years ago, women living on the prairie, you know, in in the United States or women living anywhere in a village in the middle, middle ages, like you depended on the physical strength of men around you to do 
do things like, like I couldn't throw a bale of hay up and do that in the farm. I, I couldn't do, I physically couldn't do a lot of the work that agriculture required. And I think that was the connection that as we moved away from hunting, gathering kind of things, there's a lot of agricultural things that are harder for women to do because we don't have the same upper body strength. And so we kind of, you know, that sort of led to women, you know, it, to me, what I saw is how women were vulnerable. It made me see how women would be vulnerable physically. Right. And so if the men around you were not virtuous, then your life was kind of fucked. And so Penelope, at least Odysseus, right. Right. I, I was going to say, because even when the women were revered, like those early hunter-gatherer societies, yeah. and that's always a misnomer, right? Because we were all right. hunter-gatherers. You know, we have yeah, this all of, yeah, notion right. of, you know, the women did the gathering and the cooking and all that, and the men did all the yeah. hunting. That's not true. We all yeah. did everything. Yeah. Right. But because the women... Uh, were revered, especially in these early um, like nomadic cultures when they started to come up with the concepts of, you know, witches and wise women and healers and all of those things, because the men were stronger, it was their job to protect the -hmm. women, Mm -hmm. even though the women themselves were likely much more physically strong than we have given them credit for, right? Because when you go back far enough, in history and mythology you have the original Amazonians, which I'm yeah. fairly certain could do fucking anything that a man. Right. Could do. Oh right. yeah. The, yeah. Penthesilea. She, she was, she was, uh, she was an equal match for Achilles. Right. You know, that was, that's, they, they fought man to woman. Like that was, right. Right. you know, one-on-one, and, you know, and, but, and, but and think- in the ancient, in the ancient world, that would, that that's a big deal to right. fight. Right. You only matched up the heroes to somebody else who was equal, you know. Right. Um, right. So that was a big deal. But I, I see that in the day to day life of women, that, you know, as especially as we move toward agriculture, you know, when you think about like farm life, there's a lot of things that women can do, and right. there's things that women physically can't. And I, I see that as, like I'm remodeling a house by myself and there are things that I physically cannot do. And I'm like, damn it, right. it's too right. heavy for me or it's too right. big for me. I can't get it. But then I have my, I call my son and he'll be like, oh, you mean this? And I'll be like, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> yes, that, I need that. Help me. So I see that. That happens in my house without men. <laughs> my wife will be like, can you open this for me? Yeah. I um, You know, there's just there are things so right, I, right. if if a man if, if the men in your life were on some sort of equal plane of what was considered virtuous right that you know Odysseus is seen as sort of like the virtuous husband he right. comes back and he takes care of he kills all the suitors and he makes sure that his wife is now in a safe place then we can go all kind of ways with that but right. Agamemnon you know and, and at least away from her He's not talking smack about it, right? He wants right. to get back to her. But Agamemnon is like the whole other opposite. Like, like you killed the daughter, you're talking smack about her. Like, you're a jerk. Nobody <laughs> likes you, Agamemnon. Like, nobody <laughs> likes you at all. And even Clavinestra. And when you get back, she's going to kill you. She's going to kill you. And that's exactly what happens. But she is different than Penelope because she's not seen as the long-suffering. She, I see her more as cold she's uh cold and calculated and smart so who was the last one you wanted to talk about um and no kind of you kind of touched on her but and she was paris's first right 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 so that's anoni she's a wood nymph and he marries her and they actually have a son corthus and uh he leaves her and their son and goes to uh decides to live in the city of troy and he with helen and that was and part of the chronology that i that developed was that paris had to be much older paris was older than achilles paris is like a whole 
big brother, like 18 years older than, than Achilles. He had to be. Right. And I can't. And so that kind of feeds into the story with the Noni that he had a whole life with her and a son that he abandoned. Cause if the, if the story of the apple took place at Thetis and Peleus's wedding, Achilles hadn't even been born yet. So it has to be a long time after that before Achilles would then be going off to fight in the war. He has to get born and grow and train. <laughs> right, right. Right. So it's years later. So the promise that Aphrodite made to Paris was years before even Hel Helen hadn't even been born yet. So that, I mean, so there's a whole, I, I go into that. I've got podcasts on it. So it was just something that I thought that didn't make any sense to me. Like, well, but there has to be, you know, and I mean, and Helen had to have her own life too. She had to get kidnapped first by Theseus and then take him, you know, her brothers had to, her brothers had to, you know, um, basically raise Athens to the ground and get her back, which is why the whole thing about Helen, the oath of Tyndarius being important was that Helen had already been kidnapped. So if she never got kidnapped again, that there'd be a ready to go army to go get her back because she'd already right. been kidnapped already, but this was right, already right. the experience. So um, there's this whole life. So he marries Anoni and he loves her until then. Of course he, I think he's under a love spell. That's how I, that's how I view it. There's like this magical element. And I do keep the magical element in there between Helen and Paris. And it's almost like, I love you. And then when she realizes that when Helen realizes that, wait a minute, this, my feelings for you aren't real. Like I basically, I've been created just to fulfill a promise. Like I left my husband and I abandoned my baby daughter for some magical bullshit. Like, damn it and then and then they then, and then and then and then they then she's all of a sudden they're, they're fucking like oh my god like it's one of like i hate myself i hate right, myself right. and i don't like you but oh my god now i but like be it's like an addiction right like you i want to quit but i can't right like, like right. that and i love that you I, I, janelle let me just say that i love that your lens of these particular strands of mythology are have lots of, you know, sexual scandal and romantic <laughs> intrigue. And there's a lot of drama because you know what? There probably was a lot of drama. Right. Right. There, there were a lot of, you know, slamming of hut doors or whatever. Yeah. Know? Like there, there'd be a lot of, it, you know, and a lot of um, drunken debauchery and yeah, lots of all stuff. Of that. I'll tell you, I wrote this scene. I don't know if we can talk about this show, but I wrote a scene where after um, Clive Nestor had given birth to their son, so like there's there's years like you see Clive Nestor and Agamemnon way before the war, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote a scene where she's basically he's getting impatient about when he can have sex with her again. You know, she's nursing the baby and he gets kind of turned on by it so she puts the baby on the other side of the bed and then they proceed to like have some you know hand-to-hand -hand contact <laughs> and uh and i get you know and he kind of gets on there and he suckles a little bit and and then somebody said this is so much porn and terrible and i'm like have you never had like every man out there not every man but i will i will guarantee you uh, the percentage is high of men who are like Hey baby, let me just let me just try that one time. Let me try like, that, right? Let me try that one time. <laughs> and and if women are honest, they would they would say like, yeah, I let them. Mm -hmm. I just get curious. <laughs> but like, I, there have been readers who don't appreciate that, right? But I'm like, right. I feel like that's real. But it, and for the and for Clytemnestra's character, it fits because she's using her sexuality to control her world right well and, and, you know, and it's interesting because that is you, you know you talk about giving them you know these very modern day kind of human characteristics and I think that that's true I, I a long time ago I read and I wish I could remember who it was uh 
but it was this author and she talked about how the people that she worked with, because she did a lot of like mission work and volunteer work all over the world and, and interviewed a lot of different kinds of people for this book that she was writing um, about the common threads of humanity, regardless of where, what, how, why. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how even when she talked to teenage aged uh, refugees who were, you know, fleeing from war-torn countries and all of that, given the opportunity, they would talk about how they were concerned because their boyfriend was on the other boat with this other girl that they didn't like. You know what I mean? And it was yeah. it was really, I mean, I'm minim, you know, I'm I'm minimizing and paraphrasing, but it was really remarkable uh to read that, that yes. these teenage aged kids were. They had the concerns of your everyday white American teenager. You know what I mean? I, it, so because I, it, there, there's a very human element. And I think that it's not unlike, um, you know, when I think about, I don't, I, I, I think that the capacity to have the emotions that we do, right. it, it's not like jealousy is a, is a modern thing, right? I think jealousy right, has right. been a part of the human fabric forever that's right. part of what makes us human right the way that we have grief the way that we have love just because love was not the first option to marry somebody doesn't mean that people didn't have those feelings or develop love or have any you know things that we would associate with those feelings right so right, right. Those, that's all part of being human on the male and female side or right. on any or any kind of gender or fluid side, like right. to, to be human is to have a whole range of feelings that under certain circumstances will come out of you as a person. So what might make me jealous might not make the next person jealous. Right, right. Or what what would cause me to have feelings of love might not be what causes somebody else to have love. But the fact that I have those feelings and that another person would, we can identify with that. Even if what turns us on or what floats our boat or whatever uh, is different, we recognize the feeling of it. Right. Cause when we're broken hearted or we have grief, it doesn't matter. Uh, when I think that grief, we experience grief the same. I think in our right. modern world, we tend to, especially in the Western world, we tend to minimize grief specifically. Right. We glorify love and we minimize grief. And in other countries around the world, like, you know, grief, but, you know, it's like, I'm just going to say Americans, like you look at people like weeping on graves and, uh, you know, right. wailing and other countries have different ways to publicly show their grief. As Americans, we're like, we've got to be all stoic. We're just all at the grave. Right. So that, that's what I was just thinking. Like, that, that a up. lot of other Pull cultures really. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that a lot of other cultures really celebrate death. And right. Or in the West, we're very. Yeah. About the whole affair. And it yeah. isn't like that everywhere. And, and I think, you know, and that's also a cultural context, too. Right. right? Yeah. I um, did. I did. When I buried my dad. Um, they did the, uh, as the oldest child, I was presented the flag and they did mm -hmm. the whole shooting of the guns. And it was, I almost couldn't even, it, it almost didn't even seem real. Right. Because you see right. it in movies, mm -hmm. but when it was happening, like, oh my God, this is my life right now. This is, right, you know, right. and, and you, and you do feel like you feel that every time they would fire the guns, I mean, it just like your whole chest you know it was shocking right i don't right. even think i cried i i, I was just I, I was just like it, it was just my chest was just i was just being shocked every time the gun went off and it was right, just right. like I, almost like i couldn't almost like it made me kind of numb it in a weird way like it was ugh. but um yeah i could you know but i there was a very much a sense of you know like I didn't feel like I could just like scream out and throw myself on the ground. Right. Which but is some cultures do what, that. 
Yeah, exactly. Which is kind of like what I wanted to, which is kind of what I wanted to do. But that's my point is that we are, we are so feel. fucking puritanical here. It's ridiculous. It's right. It, that is a whole other show. That, um, right. A whole other show. So back to Anoni. Right. So we were, yes. um, she gets left behind. She is definitely, uh, she's distraught. Yeah. And there was a prophecy that was that in the in the end he was going to need her uh her healing skills. She was a healer. So he was gonna need her healing skills. And in the end, she gets jealous. She's jealous of Helen. And when Helen comes to her and says, you know, Paris has been hit by these poisoned arrows, and then she she says, No, like I'm not gonna come in, I'm not gonna come in help him and she then relents after you know she feels guilty then she she does go to uh help and he's already passed yeah so there's that but anoni is the forgotten wife so she she's just the one languishing in sorrow and she does send her she eventually sends their son their teenage son to the city of troy because he is a he is mm. Paris's legitimate heir, you know, conceived in a marriage. So he's he Corthus goes to Troy, but under secrecy. Like he, Paris doesn't realize Helen kind of keeps him secreted away, and um, she. Well, that's a whole other Hel, Helen's a whole other ball of wax. Yeah, we should do we should do another show and a whole show. Yeah, we should do Helen. one on Helen. But I because feel like Helen, I know the me, Helen mythology plays into a lot of goddess stories. Yeah, as well, and and, and I think yeah, yeah. It's, right. And and I think that we it's when I think I like archetypes. So we have light and shadow, and I I see that there's gray, and I see that mm-hmm. an individual, you know, we don't always shine in the light side of an archetype or the dark side, but sometimes we're in the gray. Right. I think. Right. right. So and, and I think Helen is all over that map right. Right. of light and dark and gray. And um, but Anoni was during the war. Um, I think she represents the wit, uh, even though she's a goddess, a, a you know, lower level goddess, but she represents most of the women who are just literally left behind. Right. Wondering hoping uh and maybe disbelieving and just left to carry on day after day uh taking care of whatever had to be taken care of uh, and think about um most of the men would be gone right and over right. a period of 10 years plus their younger sons are now teenagers early 20s because right. they weren't old enough to go off and fight. So you have a society of very young men and women. They're very young fatherless being, men. <laughs> yeah, very young fatherless men. And there might have been some grandpas around, right, that were right, too old right. to go. Right. But but they would start dying off, right. you know, because we're talking about 10 years. So by the time the guys would sail back, you're looking at a decade to 12 anywhere from like just average 12 years or so before they get back. That's a long time. So if you're 12, now you're 24 and that's where all the suitors come in. Like you got a lot of younger guys that are vying. Right. Right. It's not old farts. Like she's 40 years. Let's say she's about 42 and she's got a bunch of, you know, happy go lucky 20 year old or 20 mid 20 year old guys that are, trying to get at her because they want right, the power. Right. They've never been to war. They're untested. They're untested. Right. right, right, They're, right. They have like, it's sort of maybe the way we look at some of the younger generation now, like, oh my God, you guys just, you're, you, you have no idea what it was like to live without the internet. Right, right. Which is us doing to them the same thing our parents did to us, right? Exactly. Yeah, like paper route, uphill, both ways, in the snow. <laughs> it, it right. we're barefooted. Right. Well, one shoe, no socks. <laughs> yeah, every generation. So I, I feel like so you have a society of of a lot of you know basically young 
men and women who are now of marriageable age. Nobody, everybody's fatherless. Right, right. Think about that. Most yeah. people are fatherless and they don't even know if their dads are coming home. And then, and then as the woman of the house, you can control that until what point, right? Um, right until right. your son gets a beard. Cause right. now you're, now your son is the boss. Right. Think about right. that. Right. And that, and that's reflected in the story of Penelope because, Tele because Odysseus said, look, hold it together. But if I don't come back before Telemachus grows a beard, you know, if, if, if I'm not back by then, then, then take another husband. Cause that means I'm probably dead. And she's right. like, I don't want to hear that. And that was the whole weepy story. You know, she's like, I'm not going to do that. And so what's happening in the odyssey is we start to see that telemachus is coming into his manhood he's, he's getting to that growing a beard part of his life right but right. that's also representing probably a lot of young men right right at that time they are now like i don't want to be under my mother's thumb right and so anoni to me represents that forgotten woman most people don't even know about anoni they don't even know right. that paris had another family that he left behind Right. So yeah. that's that was why I wanted to talk about her and bring her up, because that think about what was going on in in these societies, these villages, these right, these, right. You know, cities. Set without... the stage for all the drama. Yeah. Okay, Janelle, I think we should wrap things up. All right. Uh, I ask all the guests the same three questions at the end of the show. Uh oh. OK. Yeah. Uh Tell me a fun fact about yourself that people would be surprised to discover. Mm, that um, uh, fun fact. Uh, I, I I guess I like tattoos. Okay, you're right. <laughs> Most people don't guess. expect. I wouldn't guess yeah. that by looking at you. Yeah, no, I, ha I, and yeah, I'm, I am planning like a full sleeve. So it is surprising to be like, what? You know, I'm wearing like yes. long sleeves. They don't see that. And then I can take a sweater off. I'm like, oh my gosh, she has all these tattoos. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, current favorite TV series or movie? Ooh, Peaky Blinders. Wow. That was really good. We were sad to see it end, but it's so good. Oh, tell me, I just started season three and I was like, uh, I think yep, yep. Grace just got shot or something. I was like, yeah. what? But I can't yeah. even watch this anymore. Oh, so so I just stick with oh. it to the end because it yeah. really couldn't end any Oh my way. God. I don't okay. know how I missed it. Okay. If your life were a movie, what would be the theme song? on the soundtrack of your life? Uh, oh. I'd have to say, oh my gosh, <laughs> my, my brain just went blank. Um, theme song, Take On Me by Uh Huh. I believe that's take me on. Take me on, yeah, yeah. Take me on that one. You're right. That it. Okay. That it's all gone in a day or two. Yep, yep. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. All right, now. Well, I'm glad that we were finally able to schedule this. Um, me too. And like I said, I will. I'll be in touch. Okay. And I'll send you copies. Right. And uh, in the meantime, we'll keep following you on Instagram and Facebook and all, places. all those other things. So where we all are, right? That's what we were talking right. about before the show started. Yeah. We have to be right. everywhere. We don't have a choice. So that's right. All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, thank we'll you for having me. Talk to you soon. OK, bye. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks for watching or listening. If you want more of The Girlfriend God, you can find The Girlfriend God and The Girlfriend God podcast on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. The girl